Okay, so welcome again, uh, everyone, to this new session of the BioClock Academy. Very nice that you're all joining. My name is Laura Pape, and I'm a PhD student at the BioClock um, Bio Consortium. And together with me, we have uh, Oana Georgiana Bus Oswald, who is a postdoc, and we will host the session today. So, for those of you who are new here today, what's the BioClock um, Academy all about? So, the consortium is a Dutch research um, uh, re Dutch research consortium founded by Professor Joke Meyer and also Dr. Laura Kevese, who we are very honored to have today as our speaker. Uh, and the BioClock Consortium includes more than 20 research projects in which the interdisciplinary teams of researchers, clinicians, local governments and other partners join forces to preserve and restore the health of the biological clock. Uh, and ultimately, um, yeah, aiming to improve not only um, our own health, but also uh, the world and the yeah, environment around us. And this series is organized, um, so the BioClock Academy series, organized within this consortium each third Wednesday of the month um, for anyone who's interested in the field of chronobiology, but especially um, early career researchers. And we aim to introduce you to basic concepts and equip you with the proper knowledge uh, of the field of chronobiology with expert speakers in the field. So now we will have a 40 minute talk followed by 15 minutes of discussion. And we aim to close the session at 5 p.m. And you can also write your questions in the chat so we can discuss them at the end of the talk. So Georgiana will introduce our speaker. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Uh, so Laura Kevise is an assistant professor at the Leiden University Medical Center in the Department of Cell and Chemical Biology here in the Netherlands. And her research, uh, in her research, she is interested in the 24-hour rhythm and the physiological processes behind it. Um, so especially the physiological consequences which occur due to the misalignment of this rhythm. And um, these misalignments can be often encountered in night shift workers, elderly people, and hospitalized patients, which are mostly the populations of interest for Laura. Um, and uh, hence, her research aims to develop strategies to strengthen the circadian clock function in these populations. And with this, uh, I uh, don't want to give too much more insights into it. Uh, I want to give the floor to Laura, who can teach us a bit more of the specificities of her research. So welcome, Laura, and looking forward for your talk. Yes, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, yeah, so no need to introduce myself because it was an excellent uh, introduction. So yeah, so today I would like to talk about uh, human chronobiology in the lab and in the field and how we can go from molecular rhythms to circadian medicine and everything in between. Um, yeah, so life on Earth evolved under bright days and dark nights. So we zoom out a bit and we see the Earth uh, rotating on its axis. And yeah, so this might sound very trivial, but what's uh, actually this, this rotation of the Earth has very profound consequences for our behavior and our physiology. Uh, of humans, but also of the animals and plants around us, of course. Um, so as a result of the rotation of the Earth around this axis, uh, most animals, including humans, have evolved a circadian clock, um, which is yeah can be seen as an adaptation to the daily changes in our environment. So if you have a, a clock in your body, it allows you to anticipate changes in your environment that are very predictable, such as the changes in light and darkness, in uh, temperature, or in food availability. And the way this clock uh, functions in mammals, including humans, is um, that there's a central clock in the uh, get a pointer. There's a central clock in in the brain in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, um, and there are peripheral clocks in in the rest of the body. And the central clock is able to sort of orchestrate all these peripheral clocks that are located in the different organs in our body. Um, so it's able to autonomous autonomously generate a approximately twenty four hour uh, rhythm and it's synchronized to the uh, to the to the to the environment mainly through light but also through feeding um, and in that way the the body is able to yeah to sort of tell the time of day so yeah so we see circadian rhythms at the molecular level but also if you zoom out more for example hormone uh, hormones show 24 hour rhythms uh, but also metabolism immunity and cardiovascular system all show circadian 
uh, rhythm. So they are uh, higher at certain moments of the day compared to other moments of the day. And oh. yeah, so to, in today's talk, I would like to go more into, so what are circadian rhythms and how do we measure them in humans? So that's in the first part. And in the second part, I would like to go into the adverse health effect of circadian misalignment, which has been a, a, a focus of my research for, for some time. And then also go into the circadian clock and the clinical opportunities it offers. So yeah, the first part. So yeah, what are circadian rhythms? So I think in general, since this is also meant to be an educational seminar series, I would like to go into this a bit, a bit more. So in general, you can distinguish between 24 hour rhythms, um, for example, in, in biological processes, which can be any cyclic phenomenon that oscillates with a period of 24 hours. So this can, for example, if you look at core body temperature, if you if you would measure it across the day uh, and night, you would see that there are lower, uh, yeah, you would have a lower temperature when you're sleeping and higher when you are awake. Um, so you would see a very clear 24 hour rhythm. But to be able to actually speak of a circadian rhythm, um, you're really talking about a cyclic phenomenon also that's approximately 24 hours. Um, but by definition, this rhythm should be self-sustained. So that means that this rhythm should continue in the absence of, uh, of timing cues um, with a period that's approximately, but not exactly uh, 24 hours. And also by definition, it should be entrainable. So that means that this, this rhythm that's approximately 24 hours um, should be able to, to sort of synchronize to the 24 hour cycle by external cues uh, such as light. And then another more biochemical definition is that it's also um, yeah, should be temperature compensated. So that means that the, the, the period of the rhythm is maintained despite any changes in the ambient temperature. So you can, these 24 hour rhythms, you can study them, uh, yeah, as I call in the wild, so in field conditions, um, but these circadian rhythms are harder to measure and you can only, or well, mostly do it uh, under highly controlled conditions in a laboratory. Yeah, so how do we know that, that humans have a circadian rhythm if they are so yeah, relatively hard to measure? So the, the first evidence that really these circadian rhythms exist in humans came from um, uh, experiments by Jürgen Aschoff, one of the, the founders of the field of, uh, of uh, circadian biology, um, at least human circadian biology, who um, did these uh, bunker experiments. So he invited research participants to, uh, to a bunker in, in Germany and um, uh, yeah, these people were stayed in that bunker for for uh, yeah for weeks and months at a time, and by that they they he could study um, rhythms in constant conditions. So here in the picture on the right, you see a uh, yeah times when the participant is sleeping during normal and trained conditions, so in a light dark cycle, and you see this this person is sleeping uh, when it's when it's dark and waking up at the end of the dark phase. Um, in a very constant manner. Then if this person goes into the bunker, what happens on, on average is that people go, uh, uh, yeah, as you can see here, the sleep will delay a little bit every day. So showing that, um, yeah, there is a rhythm that's approximately 24 hours because sleep occurs on a, on a regular cycle, but the period is a little bit longer than, than 24 hours. And also if you would, for example, measure core body temperature in this person, you would see that also the core body temperature would um, would still have a cycle of approximately 24 hours with, with a period that's a little bit longer. Um, yeah, so then on the on the molecular level, um, how are these uh, rhythms uh, uh, regulated? Um, this is by a transcriptional translational feedback loop. So that consists of uh, transcription factors called BMO1 and CLOCK. They bind to, uh, yeah, to e-books in the promoter of E. And there they drive the transcription of, uh, for example, uh, cryptochrome and period genes. So all these genes that I show in this picture are called uh, clock genes. Um, and they then are uh, transcribed, translated, and they move back to the nucleus, form a dimer, and then they inhibit the, uh, the activity of the transcription factors. So this creates a loop of um, waxing and waning uh, protein levels of these clock genes. Um, uh, that takes and this loop takes approximately 24 hours to complete. So if you look, for example, at the expression of one of these genes called PER2, you will see that, for example, in the SCN, so in the supervised metric nucleus, there this the expression of these genes shows very clear 24-hour uh, patterns. But you can also look in, in other tissues. So this is in mice, so you can, for example, look at kidney or liver or lung. And you also see that this 
uh, gene shows 24 hour rhythms in its uh, expression. You can also do this in humans. So you can invite humans to a laboratory and take regular uh, blood samples uh, across the day and the night. And you will also see that these same, same genes in, um, in blood cells show a very clear 24 hour uh, pattern. So this molecular clock exists um, yeah, actually in, in most cells in the, in the body. So you can also see in this picture that, well, there's of course this loop, but there is also clock controlled genes. So these transcriptional transcription factors and also other, um, yeah, other help, other clock genes that are not in this picture, they drive the expression of clock controlled genes. And as a result, actually many, many genes in, in, in different cells show a 24 hour rhythm. So these genes can be involved in any process, um, uh, that shows a circadian rhythm. So for example, uh, genes related to the immune system or to metabolism, um, they will show depending on the tissue a 24 hour or circadian rhythm. And that gives them rise to the physiological uh, rhythms that we observe. Yeah, so then there uh, yeah, are very specific uh, protocols you can use to tease apart these endogenous circadian rhythms um, to really tease apart the um, yeah, the 24 hour rhythms that are evoked by external influences or the endogenous circadian rhythms that are generated by the circadian system. And usually these um, protocols are, uh, yeah, take multiple days. They are in, in time isolation. So that means that the research participants are, for example, in a room like this and they are, um, yeah, in time isolation. So that means that participants are not supposed to know what time of day it is. So they, yeah, they are not influenced by just having the knowledge of time of day. So usually in these type of experiments, as an experimenter is also quite interesting to uh, to conduct these experiments because you're for for example not not allowed to to say good morning or good evening to the participants because that would reveal a time of day. So it's uh, yeah, so you just say hello or uh, or whatever. Um, and also during those protocols, there's a tight control of the light dark cycle and food intake, uh, activity levels, and and sleep. Um, and then yeah, so what can you measure to in humans to, to have a readout of the central clock is, um, yeah, so some well-established markers are, for example, melatonin, which is a hormone um, released by the pineal gland and is on, on the direct influence of, uh, of, the, of the SCN, so of the central clock. Um, and melatonin levels are high during the uh, dark, so when people are usually sleeping, melatonin is high, and during the day, it's, it's low. Uh, for cortisol, you see, it's also uh, yeah, a marker of the central circadian clock uh, levels rise throughout the night and are usually highest upon awakening and then slowly decrease during the day. And it's sort of similar for temperature, the, the minimum is during the night and is higher uh, during the day, so also in the circadian. Uh, uh, yeah, it also shows a circadian rhythm. So one such protocol you can use, and this, this, this is called the force desynchrony protocol, um, can be used to uncover the endogenous period of the human circadian clock. So a forced desynchrony protocol is when people are placed uh, or sort of housed in a, uh, yeah, on, on a, a cycle that's not 24 hours, but for example, in this, in this case, uh, housed on a, a 28 hour light dark cycle, or it can also be a 20 uh, hour light dark cycle. Um, and so what's, what happens in this protocol is that the, the sleep is scheduled every day four hours later. So people are on a 28 hour cycle and then, um, yeah, for example, meals are given throughout uh, throughout the waking periods of this protocol. And then, yeah, what you can see, you can, for example, look at uh, core body temperature and measure it continuously. And what you would see is that there's a, yeah, a rhythm. And then using statistical analysis, you can um, separate the intrinsic circadian process from the evoked process that's, um, yeah, that's generated by the pattern in um, sleeping and, and waking. So using these... Uh, yeah, using this, this, these statistical models, you can tease these apart. And then using, um, yeah, using such protocols, it has been established that the, the free running, so the endogenous period of the circadian clock is on average um, a little bit longer than 24 hours, so 24.2 hours. So that would mean that as you saw in the, in the, in the bunker experiments, um, by themselves, people would, would sleep every day a little bit, uh, yeah, go to bed a little bit later relative to the, to the to clock time. Uh, another protocol um, that exists is a constant routine protocol. 
uh, which is a little bit more, more simple because it takes less time than the force desynchrony protocol. Um, so what this basically is, is that um, uh, yeah, constant routine protocol is where people are placed in uh, constant ambient lighting levels and a constant room temperature. Uh, participant is asked to remain awake in a constant posture for usually um, yeah, usually 28 or 40, 40 hours. And the nutritional intake is distributed throughout the day and the night. So to really remove the influence, not only of the environment, but also of, of behavior. So for example, of sleeping and, uh, and food intake. So here in the picture, you see a uh, yeah, first baseline day of someone that was in a, in, a, in a constant routine. So you see core body temperature. And in black, you see one participant. And you see, well, body temperature is low during the night and high during the day. And the stride bars are averages. So you see in this participant, it's quite similar to the average. Then if you look in a constant routine, um, you see that the core body temperature of the participant is a lot earlier than the, the average of the uh, of the participant. So this reveals that despite the normal 24 hour rhythm in core body temperature, the circadian rhythm um, is, is, is uh, advanced by six hours in these constant routine conditions. And then this also um, matches um, so this participant was also studied in a fourth synchrony protocol, and it was found that their circadian period was 23.7 hours. So that's really a lot, or well, a bit shorter than, than 24 uh, hours compared to no other people who, uh, on average, have a period that's a bit longer than 24 hours. So you can use these type of protocols to, for example, um, study extreme phenotypes in, uh, um, yeah, extreme circadian phenotypes. So we know that there's also yeah, quite some inter-individual variation. So for example, as I just showed with this participant, um, so what you can see here is that the endogenous circadian period um, yeah, varies quite a bit depending on the on the participant. So you can, this was established um, with core body temperature um, in people, but you can also, for example, look at molecular rhythms. So these were um, skin biopsies that were taken from healthy participants um, and then uh, a BMO1 construct was luciferase um, construct was, was introduced. Um, so you can measure the expression of the of uh, BMO1 in these in these fibroblasts. And what you can see is that um, from different participants, also at the level of the fibroblast, the endogenous period is very different. So then you might ask, yeah, what's the relevance of this? It's nice to know that there is different endogenous circadian periods, but what do we actually re notice from this in, in real life? Um, yeah, so one thing that we know is that there's also quite a bit of inter-individual variation in uh, circadian timing uh, in the field. So we can, for example, see this by uh, looking at chronotype, which is a, uh, uh, yeah, can be derived from a questionnaire, looking at when do people uh, sleep during working days and when do they sleep on, on free days. And then chronotype is um, yeah, sort of the midpoint of sleep on three days corrected for any sleep depth that's accumulated during uh, working days. And yeah, it shows quite a big distribution throughout, uh, uh, throughout the population that's partly uh, influenced by age. So you see that during uh, adolescence, people usually get uh, a later chronotype, uh, so become night owls. And then across lifespan, this decreases again to um, yeah, people becoming more early types, so uh, more uh, morning people. And there's also a difference between sex where men usually have a later chronotype than, than women. So then if we put the lab and the field together again, we can see that there's a, a relationship between this questionnaire derived a chronotype and the phase of physiological circadian rhythm. So morning types have an earlier, um, earlier peak and an earlier trough of their core body temperature and also of their uh, melatonin rhythms. So showing that these um, yeah, behavioral um, uh, the behavioral processes also correlate to uh, physiological processes. So yeah, so that brings me to the end of part one. So we've seen that special protocols can be used to uncover endogenous circadian rhythms in uh, humans in laboratory conditions. And so, and we can observe circadian rhythms at multiple levels. Uh, so from sleep wake behavior to hormones to molecular processes. And there's individual viability that's observed um, both in central and peripheral circadian rhythms. So, yeah, so then the question is, um, yeah, so there are circadian rhythms, but how are they relevant for, for our health? And what we 
yeah, what we know is that circadian clock is very important for for health, and it's also shown in in this picture. So we know when people have a healthy clock, it supports healthy sleep, it supports uh, the, the cognitive functioning, but also organ functioning, for example, uh, uh, glucose regulation or uh, the cardiovascular system. And when the clock is disrupted, this is related to uh, poor sleep quality, but also depression and mental health or cardiovascular problems. Um, yeah, so showing the relevance of, of the circadian clock to, to health. Um, and so one way to look at this, this is that our environment has drastically changed over the over the past uh, yeah decades, I would say, or past century, in that um, our circadian system actually evolved under the yeah, very uh, cons or very rhythmic conditions. So as I said, in earlier bright days and dark nights, um, but now in our society we have a lot of shift work. There's sleep deprivation, uh, more uh, aging, and therefore also more disease. There's exposure to light at night. Uh, we can have uh, jet lag, uh, or and we spend more time indoors. So there's less of a contrast between uh, light and dark during the day. And we have altered feeding patterns by food being available at any moment of the of the day and night. So this can create a state that's called circadian misalignment, whereby the uh, circadian clock and the external environment are uh, yeah are mismatched. So there's a misalignment between these different processes. So yeah, so the way to visualize this is so you can have a circadian alignment whereby um, yeah, all physiological processes are in line also with our behavior and activity levels. So there are sleep at night, activity during the during the day, and melatonin and cortisol and body temperature, but also clock genes in our uh, peripheral tissues having a stable uh, phase relationship. Um, whereas during circadian misalignment, for example, uh, as happens in shift work, the sleep and activity levels are not, um, yeah, are not in line anymore with uh, with the uh, physiological processes in the body. So the hormones and the uh, and the clock genes, which as a result will these rhythms will be blunted and also more uh, more disrupted. So one of the most extreme cases of circadian misalignment is night shift work. So approximately. 20% of the workforce is involved in night shift work. And we know from epidemiological studies that this has uh, different adverse health effects. So this is a summary of different systematic reviews in which the relative risk was found, for example, for workplace accidents. Um, yeah, so night shift work is associated to an increased risk of, of accidents, but also on the longer term, it's related to, uh, for example, an increased risk of stroke or type 2 diabetes weight gain, cancer, and coronary heart disease. So it's a topic that deserves more attention if we want to continue doing night shift work in a more healthy uh, and want also want to support it in a more healthy uh, way. So, yeah, so then the question that I've been interested in in my research uh, previously is what are the mechanisms that link night shift work with the with adverse health outcomes? So you might, uh, yeah, so this is a well, picture with arrows showing that shift work is in is related to increased health risk, um, which might be due to unhealthy lifestyles by itself um, that are uh, promoted by shift work. Also, maybe more psych psychosocial stress uh, in shift workers. Uh, sleep deprivation in itself might also have health uh, health consequences. There's also circadian misalignment that might independently also increase health risks. So then, the question is, how do we separate these all these factors? Um, uh, from each other. So how can we study circadian misalignment in isolation and show or see if it has um, if it has health effects? So then we come back to the to the laboratory where we can study uh, uh, people in isolation. And um, so one study that has been performed uh, by uh, by uh, Frank Fier in the twenty uh, in two thousand nine was uh, in the four synchrony protocol. So that I showed earlier. So people are on a twenty eight hour day, which means that and their circadian system cannot follow this, so it will follow a approximately 24-hour uh, rhythm. So that means that um, during this protocol, sometimes the, the meals, so for example, breakfast, takes place during the biological morning of the participants. But at other times, because the the yeah because of the 28-hour day, breakfast will now take place in the biological evening of the uh, of the participants. So and lunch and dinner will then necessarily take place during the biological night. But normally the body is not uh, ready 
um, is not ready to, con to consume, uh, yeah, to, or is not adapted to consume uh, food. So what you can see in uh, an aligned state, you see, uh, for example, here blood glucose levels. Um, after each meal, there's an excursion of the blood glucose. But in the misaligned state, this is much higher. And um, also, for example, if you look at leptin levels during the misaligned state, this is lower, indicating uh, less, uh, uh, yeah, less satiety, of course. So what we can see from these uh, from these experiments is that a circadian misalignment in controlled laboratory conditions has adverse health effects. So, for example, metabolism, and already after a few days. So this is only after three days. These health effects are already uh, observed. Um, yeah, then one other study uh, I think is quite interesting because they try to separate the effects of uh, sleep restriction and circadian misalignment. So they had one group of participants subjected to, uh, to sleep restriction. So they still slept during the night, but only for four hours. And the other group um, that also slept for four hours during the protocol, but also their sleep was shifted. Uh, sometimes they slept during the, during the night and sometimes they slept during the day. And then they looked at different metabolic outcomes. So, for example, what they, they found is that um, there was a cumulative effect of sleep restriction and circadian misalignment in that um, circadian misalignment on top of sleep restriction uh, reduced insulin sensitivity and also increased inflammatory markers. Um, yeah, so showing that, uh, that circadian misalignment in addition to sleep restriction has um, also metabolic effects independent of uh, sleep loss. So yeah, what I was I've been interested in is um, what happens at the molecular level, and can we use an omics approach to um, yeah sort of characterize the molecular processes that uh, yeah that are affected by circadian misalignment. So the study design that uh, I used during my postdoc at McGill University is a simulated night shift protocol where we had um, people come into also into our, our laboratory, and we first. They first experienced a baseline day where they slept during a normal eight hours during the night and were awake during the day. And then they went on a uh, on a shift work schedule or a night shift schedule where their sleep was delayed by 10 hours. So now they were sleeping during the day and we kept them awake during the night. And then on the fourth day of this uh, cycle, we had another measurement period where we took regular uh, blood samples. So we could measure at baseline and during night shift condition, we could measure melatonin also transcriptomics and metabolomics in the blood. So yeah, so first looking at melatonin, what we see in such a protocol is that at baseline, as I said earlier, melatonin has a peak during the night and it's very low during the day. And also in the night shift condition uh, in this protocol, we see that there is no shift of this 24 hour rhythm in, uh, in plasma melatonin. So still the peak is during the, is during the night when the people are now awake and when they're sleeping during the day, the melatonin is, is low. So then we we yeah we asked what happens to the transcriptome. So we measured we could measure twelve thousand uh, gene expression profiles in uh, in blood cells, and um, yeah what we also see so comp similar to the central clock we see that the um, yeah the the the, the transcript so the the genes show a twenty four hour so many show a twenty four hour rhythm at uh, at baseline so. This is a heat map of approximately 700 transcripts that show a 24 hour rhythm where um, yeah, you see in red, so each little line is, is a different transcript. And you see that um, uh, yes, sometimes the expression levels are high in red and sometimes it's low in, uh, um, in blue. And also in the night shift, you see that these rhythms are, are relatively stable. So that means that these, yeah, most of the rhythmic transcripts do not adapt to night shifts. And then we were interested in so what are these transcripts and what are they related to? So we used uh, something called phase set enrichment analysis, where you can characterize these, um, yeah, these different genes and what molecular processes they are involved in, and what time of day they are, uh, yeah, these genes are most uh, are enriched. So for example, we see that here's a cluster of purple, so related to the immune system. So we see that um, a cluster of transcripts that are higher during the night compared to the day are related to immune system processes. Whereas, um, for example, there's also here a dark blue cluster, uh, which corresponds to metabolic processes uh, peaking more during the, during the day. So what we see here is a, um, 
yeah, actually a loss of the temporal temporal coordination of the physiological processes with the external environment because these these transfers did not shift during the night shift schedule, whereas now the metabolic demands, so caused by feeding uh, during the night, have shifted. But the, the, the genes encoding the processes that should, uh, uh, yeah, that should process the food have not shifted. So something else we looked at was the metabolome. So the metabolome can give a yeah sort of a biochemical fingerprint of what's happening uh, in the body. So in this case, we looked at blood samples. So the metabolome will, um, yeah, will will reflect changes, for example, in uh, yeah in in different tissues um, related to metabolism. So we could measure um, acylcarnitins and amino acids, uh, organic acids, and also many uh, yeah also some lipids uh, in the blood. And we could also again look at their twenty four hour rhythms. So what we um, yeah what we see here is that actually. What we found is that most metabolites were now influenced by behavior rather than by the circadian clock. So what we, as opposed to uh, the the central clock and the and the and the transcriptome rhythms, we do see that metabolites metabolite rhythms do adapt to the to the simulated shift work protocol. So now, um, yeah, it seems that behavior has a bigger influence on the metabolites than the circadian system. So there were still some um, metabolites that do that do um, yeah, they do follow the rhythm of the central clock and the transcriptome, but many more metabolites uh, were influenced by behavior. And this was very similar to what was found in a study by Deborah Skeen, which was published uh, around the same time, where also 95% um, of the circadian rhythms in the metabolome are driven by behavioral timing cues uh, rather than by the, by, the, by the clock. So what we see in summary uh, in this uh, in this part two is that short-term circadian misalignment and sleep restriction um, uh, independently uh, impair physiological processes, uh, for example, uh, hormone secretion, insulin sensitivity, and immune function. Oh. Oh, my PowerPoint is stuck. Oh, there. So if allowed to persist, we can hypothesize that these acute effects may lead to the development of, um, of for example, cardiometabolic diseases and other health problems on the, on the long term. And then we also see that on the molecular level, the effect of uh, night shifts um, cause um, a shift in the metabolome, but the transcriptome and also the central circadian clock, they remain aligned to the, to the day schedule. And then, yeah, so we can conclude that night shifts lead to a state of misalignment between the human circadian transcriptome, metabolome, and the external environment. Yeah. Um, yeah, so now, so yeah, so what we have seen so far is that circadian misalignment uh, yeah, can have adverse health effects. And you might question what's still the use of having a circadian clock um, in our modern environment? Wouldn't we be better off without a circadian clock, perhaps? Um, and I think the answer is is no. It's still very beneficial to have a circadian clock because there are many clinical opportunities that we are still learning how to harness these opportunities and and, and actually benefit from um, from this biological system. So, and this brings me to the topic of circadian medicine. Um, and so, this is also what my current research uh, focuses on: is that we can yeah use the rhythmic nature of uh, physiology. To improve different aspects of healthcare, and today I would like to uh, focus on uh, chronopharmacology, which is also a topic I covered during my uh, PhD. Um, but there is also uh, we can look, for example, into uh, also into chronobiological interventions to optimize um, the circadian clock of patients in the hospital, and that's what my current research is focusing on. And we can also look into a personalized strategy that I will address at the end of this uh, presentation, if there's still time. So first, uh, chronopharmacology, um, I think, provides a very interesting uh, uh, opportunity to improve, uh, yeah, to improve the way we, we administer drugs. So chronopharmacology is based on the principle that nearly all physiological processes are regulated by the circadian clock, and that as a result, also the way a drug uh, is, uh, yeah, is absorbed and distributed and metabolized and eliminated in your body. Um, maybe influenced by dosing time and also the interaction with the, the drug and the, the, the target receptor at the target tissue might uh, be influenced by dosing time if the target um, shows a 24-hour rhythm. So therefore, for any drug, there might be an optimal time of day 
at which the therapeutic effect is maximal and the negative side effects are, are minimal. So that's shown in, in this picture. In theory, you would, there would be an optimal time where the therapeutic effect is highest and hopefully the negative side effects are lowest. And then this would be the best time to, uh, to dose the drug. So there has been a, a systematic approach to study this. So this, this was a publication that looked at all clinical trials that looked into dosing time dependent um, effects. And it was found that 75% of all these clinical trials showed a dosing time dependent uh, efficacy or toxicity. And then this was also found to depend on the half-life of the drug. So with a shorter half-life, drugs have a higher uh, chance to be uh, get to show a, a time of day dependent effect compared to drugs with a longer half life. Um, yeah, so really a large percentage of drugs um, show this dosing time dependent effect. Um, I will skip this. Uh, but one thing I looked into during my PhD was um, one specific drug that uh, causes uh, QT prolongation. So this is a very common side effect of, of many type of drugs. So for example, antihistamines and antipsychotics, uh, but also many antibiotics they are known to prolong the, the QT interval, um, which is, um, yeah, which they do by uh, blocking uh, uh, potassium channels in the heart, and thereby they delay the, uh, the depolarization of the heart. And this is reflected into a longer QT interval on the ECG. And on, uh, in rare cases, this might lead to cardiac arrhythmias. So by taking these drugs, there's a small chance that patients will develop cardiac arrhythmias, and of course, you want to uh, prevent that. So many physiological processes involved in in this in the regulation of this QT interval show a 24-hour rhythm. So, for example, the expression of these potassium channels, uh, also potassium levels themselves, show a 24-hour rhythm, and the baseline QT interval also shows a 24-hour rhythm. So, in this um, yeah, in this study, we asked the question. Does dosing time influence the magnitude of the drug-induced QT prolongation? So we included uh, 12 healthy participants and we administered an antibiotic called levofloxacin at six different uh, time points. Um, so throughout the day and the night on separate occasions. And then we used mathematical modeling to determine the relationship between the drug concentration in the blood and the QT interval. So what you can see here is that um, so on the x-axis, there's the, lev the levofloxacin concentration, and on the y-axis, there's the QT interval. And you see when the drug is administered at 6 a.m., there's a very quite a flat relationship between the, uh, the, the concentration of the drug and the QT interval, so suggesting there's um, yeah, not really an effect of the drug on the QT interval, when, whereas when the drug is administered at 6 p.m., so in the evening, there's quite a strong rela relationship between the, the drug and the QT interval. So suggesting that there's an effect of dosing time on the effects of this drug on the uh, on this ECG parameter. So then we, we used mathematical modeling to visualize this relationship. And indeed, we can see combining all this data that the highest effect of the drug is at uh, around uh, 5 p.m. and the lowest is in the, in the early morning. So showing that it's important uh, probably to take into account dosing time when studying these type of these type of drugs. So there's um, yeah. So this is I think very important knowledge to have. But um, I think one challenge for the field of chron chronobiology in general has been how to implement this into clinical practice. So I see my time is almost up. So I will go through this a bit more uh, a bit more quickly. Um, yeah. But so the translation. So one of the challenges is the translation of findings. So uh, many studies are done in model organisms. So how do we translate these to humans? And many of the human studies have been done in the laboratory. And how do we translate them to real life is still an, uh, an open question. Um, there's also limited interest from clinicians and especially industry, because um, yeah, even though these, these are non-invasive and easy strategies, there's also not much maybe uh, to gain from, uh, from industry from, uh, from these type of findings. Um, also, compliance of patients might be hard, because how do you... Yeah, it's already hard to sometimes to convince patients to to, uh, to to take a drug, let alone instruct them very specifically on the time of day they have to take it. And there might also be operational routines, for example, in the hospital that might make it difficult to implement such findings. And there might also be differences in the timing between uh, patients. So, um, yeah, so there are some sources of individual variation in clock function that might be caused, for example, by genetics or 
age or sex hormones, uh, light exposure, and there's a whole list of this. Um, and I won't go, go into the, this, but there is a large variation of uh, the circadian clock. And then one interesting question is how do we um, actually measure the timing of the circadian clock in clinical settings? So we have seen these classical markers such as melatonin or cortisol, which require uh, yeah, very uh, frequent sampling and also highly controlled conditions to, uh, to be measured. Um, so there are luckily some potential solutions out there, for example, using a single blood sample to, to estimate internal circadian time. So there are some studies into that direction and also other studies using wearable technology to estimate internal circadian time. Um, yeah, so I'll just go into this, this quickly, but there's, um, for example, the body time essay, which was published a few years ago, which is able to uh, use machine learning to predict um, the circadian timing of individual uh, patients. So here, a, um, yeah, so using transcriptomic data and later migrated to a nanostring platform, these researchers were able to, um, yeah, to select a panel of, of, of genes that are very predictive of um, DO, DOMO, so dim light melatonin onset, which is the gold standard of uh, currently of assessing circadian timing. So it's, there's a very high accuracy and it relies on the measurement of the relative expression of 12 genes in just one blood sample. So it would be very easy to, to get a patient into the clinic, just take one blood sample and based on that be able to, to know what time of, yeah, what the biological timing is of that patient. And then be able to, to um, uh, yeah, based on that to determine what time of day, for example, a procedure or a drug treatment would be most beneficial. So one study that I was involved or that, or that I conducted was um, having participants but as I said, in the simulated night shift schedule, and we had another group of participants that were um, exposed to bright light. So we were able to um, use the, the data we collected in this experiment also to predict circadian phase um, during circadian misalignment or after a very recent shift of the, of the central circadian clock. And we were also able to show that using transcriptomic data from a single uh, blood sample can be used to predict the central circadian phase um, yeah, even, even during circadian misalignment or after recent phase shift. So even in more sort of messy conditions, we can use these type of, um, uh, yeah, we can use these, these type of machine learning approaches to, uh, to predict the phase of the circadian clock. So with that, I'm coming to the end of my presentation. Um, so yeah, what we've seen in this third part is that drug treatments and also hospital conditions may be improved by taking into account the role of the circadian clock in physiology. And there are currently biomarkers being developed to determine the timing of the circadian clock in humans. Um, and it may have the potential to tailor chronobiological interventions to the individual um, patients. So then uh, finally, so this is my last slide. Um, yeah, what we've seen is that circadian rhythms can be studied in human participants using special protocols in laboratory conditions. Uh, we've seen that the adverse health effects of circadian misalignment may be related to a mismatch between rhythms in different physiological processes. And yeah, what's I think for, uh, as a future, uh, uh, yeah, future research might look into chronobiological interventions uh, to help to prevent these adverse health risks. And finally, circadian medicine provides many opportunities to improve uh, various aspects of healthcare. So with that, I would like to thank the people I uh, work with. So they're all shown in this slide and also the, the funding bodies that are funding the research. And with that, I'm very happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you very much, Laura, for this really nice talk. 